Hi there, it's me, Bacheva, and I am going live with Helen Left, one of the fabulous therapists in my office. And we're gonna talk about what sex therapy is and what sex therapy is not. Um, so I'd have to wait for Helen to join so that I can then invite her. Um, I think a lot of people have preconceived notions about what sex therapy is. I think people are nervous sometimes about sex therapy. I think there are a lot of different kinds of sex therapy and um, we, hi Kat, oh my God, there's Kat. We just did a whole series on Facebook on sex education and talking to kids about sex. So great to see you, Kat. I'm so happy to see you wave at me. Anyway, um, just waiting to see Helen because I do not see Helen on here yet. Um, and Helen, are you there? I didn't practice with Helen because, oh, Kat said hi. Kat said hi. Um, a lot of people have a really many, many um, sort of weird ideas about what sex therapy is or don't understand that there's lots of different kinds of sex therapy and therefore don't necessarily know what they're looking for when they're looking for a sex therapist. So um, um, so that's why we thought we would do a whole thing. Um, okay, so Helen just said to me, she's not seeing me go live. Helen, go off of faith. Hi, Helen. Uh, oh, there you are. I think there you are. H H J A C D. that's you, Helen, right? Okay, good. I'm gonna invite you to join. I'm pretty sure that's you. There we go, Helen, there we go. So I think it's really, um, for those of you who are thinking about doing sex therapy, and I know there's often a lot of people who are and are kind of nervous about it, like we think it's a great way for us to kind of talk about what is sex therapy and what is not sex therapy. So I'm um, waiting for Helen. She should be joining us. It says waiting for Helen. Hopefully that's happening. Oh, great. It works. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I heard you didn't see me. You said you didn't see me live. And live I but here yeah, I am. Then I did. <laughs> oh, perfect. Okay. Um, I should also teach you, you could actually invite us to be joined, which I know is not your personality, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So hi, Helen. Helen hi. is one of the um, licensed social workers. I'm just like adjusting my camera here a little bit. One of the licensed social workers and um, one of the therapists at Maze, and she's amazing. And I've had her on to talk about other books. And she's a podcast queen. Um, <laughs> so, but for tonight, we're going to talk about sex therapy. So let's just dive right in. And I thought we would start talking about what sex therapy is not, okay? Because Great. Uh, <laughs> so let me just start by saying sex therapy is not when you sleep with the sex therapist. I mean, I, I, I feel like people, I don't know how many of those people you've encountered in your life, but oh, oh shoot, hold on. We, yeah. um, I've encountered numerous people who mix up sex therapy and sex surrogacy. So um, there are people who will sleep with you to teach you about sex. Um, they are called sex surrogates. They are a very much maligned field because actually some of the sex surrogates that I've met have been amazing, lovely people. Um, classically, um, it's illegal just, you know, in New York because I guess it's, it's lumped with prostitution. But in California, I think it's legal. Do you know, Helen? I, think I don't know, but I will recommend a movie on it for those. Go yeah. ahead. Okay. Yes. Um, Helen Hunt. Um, was in a fabulous movie. This was a few years ago called The Sessions. I believe that's the name of the movie. And it was just so beautiful. And I think that it really does illustrate sex surrogacy and how helpful it can actually be. Right. Usually, yeah. in that case, it was a paraplegic. Was it a quadriplegic? Yes, it was someone who was a polio survivor, but he was living in an iron lung. He really could not leave the trappings of, um, you know, this breathing machine. He was very severely affected by polio. Right, so he had a physical disability, which yeah. is often used in these situations. But also, um, if you look at people who either are virgins very late, like they've never gotten sexually involved with anybody and they're very, very scared and they're very like frozen by it, um, surrogates do work by having sex with um, the clients. But you need to understand that surrogates, responsible professional surrogates are trained. Um, the sex actually almost always happens at the very last of maybe like 10 sessions. Before that, they're working a lot on touching and just being able to be with somebody, um, maybe kissing, like learning how to be in your body and touch somebody and not be stressed out by it. And, um, and they're overseen by another sex therapist. So there's always a triangle of a surrogate, a sex therapist, and the client. So we're not going to address that tonight, but I wanted to tell you that when you're looking for sex therapists, you, you are not going to find somebody, unless you're looking for sex surrogate, you're not going to find somebody who's going to sleep with you. So that is not, 
Um, that is not sex therapy, nor will you find a sex therapist who will watch you having sex. Like sex therapists do not watch you having sex. I don't know how to say that in any way. Did you, was there a story you want to tell about that or am I mixing up? Did you have um, I'll continue with that. No, that's not where my story starts. Okay, that's really, <laughs> yeah, I, just, I remember Helen, anyway. So what is a sex therapist? And that is really what we want to talk about tonight because some of you are interested in doing sex therapy. I'm getting a little hearts because it's, it's true that, you know, sex therapists are not going to watch you have sex. Um, but um, what sex therapists can do is a very wide range of things. That's really the issue. Um, and I want to break that down for you because I want you to kind of understand that there's lots of different kinds of sex therapists. So, um, and Bakshava, just to like clarify that as sex therapists, we're not focusing on the genitals. We are focusing on the genital owners. And yes, yes, that, say, just say something about that. That I think is a great point. Yeah, I mean, our, you know, it's whatever the person coming to us is objective is, that's where we're, you know, we're basically, we're in the driver's seat for like psychoeducation. But in terms of what they want to see in terms of their exploration, that's up to them. And we're kind of in the passenger seat, sort of guiding. So right. it's what somebody coming to us is looking to experience and to learn about their sexuality and hopefully come to enjoy their sexuality. So when I started in this field, the first thing I was introduced to was something called the Plissit model, P-L-I-S-S-I-T. -S -S -I um, a lot of people who study sex therapy, you know, like refer to the Plissit model. And I feel like for people thinking about sex therapy, this is going to be really critical to you, the Plissit model. So Plissit stands for, the P is for permission, like giving you permission, permission to talk about things about sex, permission to think about things during sex, permission to think about what turns you on, permission to do things about sex that may make you kind of uncomfortable in, naturally. The, the L-I is for limited information. So here the sex therapist gives you the information that you need um, how does one have an orgasm? How does a penis work? How does a vagina work? What's the difference between a vulva and the vagina? How does your clitoris work? What's, what's average for X, Y, and Z for the, the amount of time that people have intercourse? Like all of that kind of information. Um, why is it that people have anxiety about sex? Lots and lots of information. So that's permission, limited information, as, as the specific suggestions, like, if you try A, this may work. If you try B, it might work. If you try C, it might work. Those are specific suggestions. And then the, t the IT is intensive therapy. And so a lot of sex therapists don't do the intensive therapy at the end. And that's something that's really important. And I'm not saying one is better or worse. What I am saying is different kinds of sex therapists do different things. So you may go find a sex therapist who will sit with you for a long time and help you figure out what feels good to you and teach you how to, like, um, think about using a vibrator or discussing things with your partner, but that's very different from dealing with deep emotional issues that might be getting in the way. And so I need you to understand that those are very different models of sex therapy. And they're both extremely valuable, but they're very different. And one of the things Helen and I were talking about is how much sex therapists kind of have to look inward when they decide to go into this field because, well, I don't want to talk for you. I don't talk too much anyway, so you talk. You are not talking too much, but I was going to add that it's really, really important, I think, for us um, as sex therapists to be willing to look at our own assumptions, our own stereotypes, our own attitudes um, about sexuality and to really dig deep into that and be very, very aware of that. And at the same time, also know that we are sexual beings in the world, but we need to separate what our sexuality is from what our patient or client or whatever you want to call the person we're working with sexuality. And I think that's really important. And that kind of brings me to the stories that um, I you know, had mentioned to you. It was and so funny. We were talking and Helen was telling me the story. And I'm like, this is a great story. I'll let me got to tell this when we do the live. Anyways, here you go. Right. So it's so like timely because I had been reading um, Glennon Doyle. She's an inspirational speaker, writer, what have you. She wrote this book recently called Untamed. And the two stories that she illustrates it just blew me away because she saw this couple's therapist, like basically 
truly her marriage happened to have been over. She was seeing this sex ther this couples therapist, clearly not a sex therapist, um, who basically she saw her for an individual session and she was telling her how she's in love with a woman. And the therapist said to her, like, this is not real. This is just a distraction. And that really kind of blew me away because it didn't seem like this was explored at all. It seemed like this therapist was coming from her own place and telling her what she's not or like how this is not real. And that really struck me. And the other story that um, Glennon Doyle told was how she was kind of talking about having sex with her husband and how she really just felt like she wasn't alive. Like she almost saw her body like floating over both of them and this feeling of like really being dead inside and, and disconnected and disconnected totally right? disconnected right and what the couple's therapist told her was to basically give him a blow job because that is more impersonal like that will make it easier for her and once again i just you know really felt for glennon like that's just not great stuff right there so i think what you're getting at there and what i think is so important for people to hear is that when therapists come in with their own agendas, as opposed to responding to your agenda, you I feel like you'll know that. Like, I, don't you feel like that's true, Alan? Like, clients know, like, as, as a matter of fact, when I, you know, the things I remember that I did badly, there was a client I was seeing who was married, a little off topic, but she was married and she had two kids and she was having an affair. And she kept telling me how great her husband was and how she really liked being married. And I kept saying to her, um, we're working on your sex life. Do you think you may want to work on, she, we're working on, oh, she was having an affair. I was helping her with her sex life with her lover. And I, and I kept coming back to, I just want to check with you. Do you want to, do you want to work on your sex life with your husband? Because maybe it won't be great, but it could be okay and good. And then, and by like the third time I did that, she turned <laughs> to me and she said, Bacheva, I don't want to work on the sex life with my husband. I'm not interested in my husband and I, and I like to, I, I said, look, I want to deeply apologize because I was also hearing her fear about losing her marriage. But rather than sitting with her and sort of working that through, I sort of was responding to that. And what did happen, of course, is her husband did find out she was having an affair and her husband did leave and the marriage broke up and she, you know, and she was devastated. But I think she would have said the same things to me. Like, in other words, it wasn't mine to encourage her to work on her marriage. It wasn't mine. I needed to work on the things she wanted to work on. So um, the story you were telling, Helen, was about a woman who ultimately did leave her husband and moved into a female relationship, right? Yes, she, was, ab she absolutely did. She just happens to be in love with this particular woman. I don't know if she will even define herself as a lesbian, but she is now married to a woman and really in a happy place in that way. But I also think, Batsheva, it's a testimonial to the work that you were doing with this woman who was conflicted, that she was able to tell you what she wanted to work on. And Stand your ground, Batsheva, lay low. Yes, totally. As a matter of fact, I'll give you another example similar where I did the right thing, and I, it was also hard for me, which was I was seeing an ultra-Orthodox woman who was married with four children, very not interested in her husband, um, very, very wild, torrid affair with another woman, actually loved her husband very, very much. Um, and I said to her, listen, we can do whatever you need to do here. So if you want me to talk to you to, to help you figure out how to keep having sex with your husband, if you want me to help you work through whether or not you want to leave and go off with this woman. And she looked at me and she said to me, Bacheva, if I go off and I go with this woman who, when she touches me, my body turns into fire, she said, I will lose my children. And I was like, yeah, you probably will lose your children because in that community, you will lose your children. So in the end, it's your choice and we could work on this either any way you want. I mean, like, and she did. I mean, we worked on her marriage, her marriage with her husband because for right now, that is what she needed. And so I think what Helen and I are both really saying to you is um, that, you need a therapist who is going to, a sex therapist, who is going to hear what you want to say, like what you need to say and actually help you with it. Yeah. Yeah. And for this woman who, again, wanted to work on her marriage, 
I can't imagine how freeing it must have been for her to at least let you know the passion that she felt for this other person. Right, because it's like the recesses of your, your brain. You know, it's so interesting. The New York Times had a piece. This is how to be 10 years ago. I was looking it up. If anybody who's watching remembers this piece about a, um, a sex therapist in middle America who was working with fundamentalist or evangelical Christian men who were gay. And he basically was helping them stay in the closet. Basically, same situation. These men were married to women, mm -hmm. had families, wanted to stay married, loved these women, but were sexually attracted to men. And so either he worked with them to figure out how to have sexual activity outside the marriage, or he worked with them to sort of, you know, fantasize but not have sexual activity. Um, and he got blasted. Like, people were like, how could you do that? You're not having the men own up to who they really are. And his art, the article was so profound because the article was saying, um, as a sex therapist, my job is to understand what you, the client, wants and try to help you be there and stay there. And my job, and there are other values in people's lives besides sex. We lose that sometimes as sex mm -hmm. therapists, but people's religion and relationships and community and family, they can be just as important or more important than sex. And so he worked with them to achieve their goals. And so I think that is really, um, really, I think that's a really profound message. So I, I just, I feel like you need to find a therapist that does that. So that's, that's piece number one. Um, the other thing is um, the, the mess, the therapists that are, what I'm going to call them right now, more behavioral messages that they're going to call behavioral messages, behavioral therapists, the one that give you kind of permission, the ones who give you information, the ones who do education. That's very different, very different from a therapist, a general therapist or a couples counselor who also does sex. And there are some of those as well. So, so that's where you need to kind of figure out what you, you want to do. But a, a, your, a, a behavioral sex therapist should at least be able to address um, some very basic shame, for example. Let's, talk, let's do some talking about shame because that is a very common theme that you see here with therapy, in mm -hmm. sex therapy. Yeah, or let's even go to the basics of normal, right? Like, what's normal? Um, that always gets me. I, I really do enjoy the word normalize. I think that's part of the work. But this idea of normal, I think that we really, really do need to ask about that. Because I don't know what's so great about normal. Um, <laughs> personally. And um, what I'm really loving, Bacheva, is I do feel that even in our culture and society, so I think that, um, like, we see women, and I think they're often coming to our practice, and they're saying, am I normal? And they're really questioning that, and they're really worried and concerned about that, and there's a lot of I shame think about the, it. The question I get more than almost any other question is, am I normal? Keep talking. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, does my vulva look normal? Like, that's a big question, because we do have this integrated practice where we do, you know, the nurse practitioner does look at, you know, the vulva vagina and reassures the person, yes, you know, or but just even knowing that we're all different, and we look different. And there's differences, but they all are within, you know, the normal, or like, are my fantasies normal? Fantasies are fantasies. I mean, you do this whole Fantasy Friday that I hope is getting through to people because I think um, that is a really, really big one when it comes to normal. Um, yeah. No, I, I think that, again, I think most of us sex therapists will feel like um, that's the most common question. And, and, and our job is not just to say, well, this is what's normal. You know, three to five minutes of intercourse is normal. 20 minutes is out of the range, but three to five minutes. Is, but if you really like 10 minutes, and that's fine, and it works for both of you, go for it, right? So we are yes. constantly feeling this normal question. But if you dig down on that normal question, what people really are is ashamed of who yes. they are. And that is when it's really, that's where we really kind of need to get at that shame piece, right? Because you wouldn't be asking if my fantasies are normal if you weren't ashamed of them. Yes, yes. And so I just, because I really think that people can relate when you talk about like movie references or you know story references so like with that and again yes we're talking about sex but I just think that this is a broader issue 
Um, also, so like one of the things I love is in Goodwill Hunting when um, Robin Williams talks about like how he and his wife like share these idiosyncrasies about each other. And he was like saying, yes, it's these imperfections. That's the good stuff. And I really do think there needs to be a shift because I think in like shame resiliency, which is this, you know, phrase that Brene Brown has been, you know, really dealing with, which kind of helps us have more empathy for ourselves and really working on, you know, acceptance and empathy and connecting with ourselves and our shame and how, you know, that's something that we really can get past, like the disgrace, the humiliation, what have you. That's also kind of a story we've been telling ourselves. And that's what we need to work through. Can, can you say more about that? Because I feel like that's such an important point and it's one that people don't hear about. Okay, so like that's more like a narrative therapy kind of perspective, which is basically that we as the person are not the problem. It's the stories that we tell ourselves about things. So it's, let's say, the stories that we tell ourselves about sex that are the problem, such as, oh my gosh, you know, there's so much shame, whether it's like a religious kind of institution, which you kind of grew up in, which says premarital sex, for instance, is not right. And you just like have premarital sex because that is what you're choosing to do. But yet you have a lot of shame and guilt over that kind of working toward, you know, more of like looking at the stories that you told yourself that premarital sex is bad. Now, again, some people who don't choose to have premarital sex because they, that's their value, that's fine. But if you're someone who, let's say, does, and you've told your story about, you know, how shameful you are and how you should burn in hell or whatever it is that this brings up for you, it's really, really important to work that through because that's going to shadow you and not be healthy for you. It's so funny. I, I have, I always tell a story about it on one day. This happens a lot, but on one day I happen to have these two different clients and both of them were like, um, so like ashamed to tell me their history. And one of them was like, I had so much sex. Like, I feel like such, I was such a slut is the word she used. She said like, I was in college and I slept with like 20 guys in the first, you know, two years. And you know, I'm sure this is like, she was so embarrassed. And then on the same day I had a patient who was like, I'm so embarrassed. I only slept with one person before I got married. I'm sure like I'm the most repressed person you ever met. Like everybody has a story. You can't win. <laughs> you can't, win. You can't yeah. win. It goes back to the normal question, but it's the, everybody has a story that they're telling themselves. Yeah. Um, yes. And those stories really shape your sense of your shame. And, um, and, and, and a good therapist, even a good behavioral therapist, mm -hmm. and I'm going to talk more about the intensive therapist, but even a good behavioral therapist should really be able to help you look at your the story you're telling yourself, the shame that you may carry, the shame that you may carry around, what is reasonable, like in other words, what the wide, huge, amazing range of what is normal and what is reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, right? Um, so, so that, those, yeah. Or you say, I, I definitely want to add something to shame. I know our time is limited, but I think this is so important. I think when there's shame, there's a lot of silence. I think there's a lot of silence around shame. And I think that once you start addressing it, that's where, you know, the good stuff happens. So really, um, you know, silence breeds more shame. And, you know, again, if you have like a safe place to talk about this, it can be so, so useful and so I, helpful. I'm so, so glad you said that because I think what some people don't realize, whether they're, the, you know, they're sexual abuse um, victims or whether or not they just have a history of th something that makes them ashamed, that the shame itself is often from holding secrets. A secret that you're just embarrassed about something, you don't want to tell somebody how you masturbate, a secret about the fact that um, you, you know, you know something about somebody. When we hold secrets, whether or not there's anything to be ashamed about, we feel shame. It's almost like the secret breeds the shame rather than the issue itself. And so um, what I really, what, why sex therapy can be so incredibly powerful is because it's a place to lay out your secrets and realize your secrets are not dark and scary and horrible, but they're, they could be heard by somebody and they could be supported, which is why you need a really, 
caring, supportive therapist. We only have about five minutes left. And I'm thinking, Helen, if you'll come back, because what we didn't touch on at all, and what I would like to talk about is there's a whole other kind of therapy, sex therapy, which is not behavioral, which mm -hmm. is um, more psychodynamic, or in some way, what we think of as therapy. Like a therapist will talk to you about your anxiety and has it, and maybe the roots of your shame, like really getting deep into the roots of your shame, maybe experiencing like history and how your history was, you know, a piece mm -hmm. of this, but really kind of doing a very broad, much deeper, deeper delve into your psyche. Yes, yes. Um, and you know, if we have a few minutes, but Shevin, is it worth like talking about messages that we got, which is, you yeah, know, go ahead. yeah, I, I think also what's really important is that, you know, when we're young, and I just like read this thing that I thought was great, that we need to teach children how to think, not what to think. Because what happens is when we're, we're little, we start getting all these messages, messages about like boys and girls, messages about men and women. And messages about I, how to dress. Oh, totally. Our bodies, and, our bodies, yeah. Yes, and these messages can be so profoundly hurtful. So like a message that I think to what you were saying is like, if a girl is told like, why are you wearing that? Kind of, the, and if they're told often, why are you wearing that from, you know, a family member, someone who's really important to them? They may get this message that their body is shameful, that sexiness is like not the way to go, like that's scary and shameful. And um, what happens is that may really, really have an effect on their sexuality in terms of maybe isolating themselves, not like wanting to be intimate out of, you know, just kind of having this idea that like being attractive isn't a good thing, it's going to lead to something dangerous or what have you. And unless that's looked at, that can, you know, be really, again, hurtful, because they got this message that they bought, because why wouldn't we buy that from our most important influences? Right, that goes kind of back to the story we tell ourselves, it's very yeah. intertwined. Right. So we only have a couple minutes left. So I think what we're going to do, I'm going to do though, is now, so what I want to leave you with sort of is that when and if you're looking for a therapist, you need to decide, do I want to see somebody a few times and sort of get the basic, the, the information and the behavior and take some quick look at the shame or the messages I got, the narratives I told myself. And, the, and the, that's a sex therapist that does that kind of work. And then if you want to delve deep, if you're saying, no, I need to go deep inside my roots to figure out what is going on, or I need to see somebody with my spouse, my, my husband, my partner, I need a couples therapist, then what you need then is a general therapist who also does sex. And that gets a little complicated, right? Because sure. lots and lots, what? Yeah, definitely. Because so many, right, so many therapists out there say, oh, I do sex, I do sex therapy. And they don't do sex therapy. They're couples therapists or they're individual couples and they just never did. So, so think about this. Either you need a, a sex educator slash therapist who's going to do a lot of behavioral, a lot of practical, a lot of that kind of work with you, which is largely what we do with every single patient who comes into our practice. Or you need a therapist therapist. And sometimes we'll refer people or one of the therapists like Helen will take on a therapy client. Who, but that's a therapist who's been trained deeply, deeply in therapeutic techniques and has a training for the sex therapy overlaid on it. And so, um, or a couples therapist who is a very, very excellent couples therapist and has a training for ther sex therapy, which is asking a lot, right? Yeah. But just talk for a minute about the people we see who've seen couples therapists who don't, like, it's mind boggling. Yeah. Right. So, again, this you know, example that I gave with Glennon Doyle, who saw this couples therapist, you know, who didn't have the sex therapy training, I believe, because this was the information that she received. And also, I, I have to laugh, but when somebody asked her, is your couples therapist any good? You know, a friend asked Glennon, is your couples therapist any good? She goes, you know, I guess so, because I'm still married. And that may not necessarily be the best answer, right? No, yeah. for sure, for sure. And so you have to go with a certain level of skepticism because I cannot tell you two things. One is 
couples therapists often have this adage, like, oh, if the, if the relationship is good, the sex will follow. And I'm sorry, that's bullshit. I don't know, I don't even have, it makes me so angry, it makes my blood boil, right? No, you can have a perfectly lovely, excellent relationship and a crappy sex life. And we see that all the time. And the and, other thing, right? And the good news is you can work on your sex life. Yes, yes. If you have a really good marriage, you can work on your sex life. And the second thing is, um, and I totally forgot what I was going to say, but the second thing is, that's pretty funny, but no, um, the second thing is that, um, oh, that a couple's counselor, so first of all, just that fixing the relationship is not going to naturally fix the sex, the sex. And the other thing is that we see couples who come in to see us, they haven't had sex in a year. They haven't had any kind of sexual activity in a year, okay? So, but they're seeing a couples counselor and they've been seeing the couples counselor for six months or a year. And I'll be like, well, what does your therapist say about this? And they'll be like, oh, our couples counselor, our sex life never came up. I am sorry, fire the freaking couples counselor. If you are having couples counseling and they are not talking about your sex life, fire the, car, the couples counselor. And you don't have to bring it up. The worst is when I have people say, I tried to bring up sex sex and it kind of she was like well we'll deal with that later that's a red flag but if she or he did not say tell me about little that was happening with your sex life in one form or another fire your couples counselor like you cannot treat a couple without also dealing with the sex right i mean I yes. think that's, that's malpractice yes. in my unless mind. they're both on the same wavelength unless it's not an issue for the couple Correct. Oh, but even then, the couple therapist should say, yes. what's happening with your sex? Yes. At which point yes. they can say, well, we're not having any sex, and we're both fine with that. And that, that, and then the therapist, if I was the therapist, I'd say, okay, <laughs> can we spend a minute talking about that? What does that mean you're fine with it? You know, tell me a little more about that. Let me understand that. And if they both are really and truly fine with it, and it's not that one of them is fine with it, and the other yeah. one is driving themselves crazy, <laughs> but feels like they can't ask for it, then, then yes, then we can move on to other things. But if you are seeing a couples counselor, and you have been seeing that couples counselor for more than three sessions or two sessions, and they have not asked about your sex life, fire the freaking couples counselor. I, 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 anyway, sorry, I'm like going off. You made your point. <laughs> No, it's really, it's really, it drives me crazy. So, but we do have to end. So how about we have you back in a couple of weeks or whatever, and we talk about the different kinds of therapy that people might want to do and the different kinds of couples therapy. Like we can talk about EFT, emotionally focused therapy. We can talk about narrative therapy. We can talk about um, um, EMDR, if you have trauma in your past, IFS, interfamily family systems, which is like my That's latest Then Sensate focus. Sensate focus. Um, yeah, we can talk about um, what other kinds of therapy are there, couples therapy out there. There's imago therapy. Um, there's a lot of different things to choose from. And so when you're thinking about sex therapy, I want to just reiterate as we close off here, you have to decide whether you want a practical behavioral sex therapist, and there are a lot of them out there. Some of them are good, some of them are not good, but there's a bunch out there. But a lot of therapists don't articulate that. So you have to call and talk to them and get a sense or you want a good, solid, regular therapist who is additionally trained in sex therapy, who will do a much deeper dive into your psyche and your life, or a couples therapist who overlays that as well. Yes. Did I leave anything out? No, you really didn't. I just do want to add that what's really important, and these days you can kind of get a flavor from a therapist, it's really important to make sure that you know that you can connect to this person. That I think is foremost. And even if you have like your first session and you just don't get a sense that this is someone that's a great match for you, it's okay to move on. You know, Shoshana Bula, who maybe I'll have on as a guest, she's not on Instagram, but she's an excellent, excellent couples counselor and sex yes. therapist. So um, she said to me, we were talking about something, she said, I always tell people who call to make an appointment that they should make an appointment with three therapists. They should have a first appointments with three couples counselors. And I'm like, what the heck? What are you talking about? And she's like, I know it sounds crazy and expensive. I'm getting a lot of hearts here. I know it sounds crazy and expensive. She said, but honestly, think about this. This is a big investment you're going to be making. So I don't say three. I say two. Make an appointment. <laughs> call people on the phone. I'm getting, I'm getting a little happening. All the, I'm getting, the bottom line is that if you're thinking about starting with a therapist, sex therapist, any therapist, Call up, spend a few minutes on the phone. That is the first thing. Just ask about their technique and how they approach things. Believe me, you'll get a very good feeling. And then make an appointment with at least two of them. If you can manage three, three. I know it sounds overwhelming, but believe me, by the end of those sessions, you will know darn well who you want to see. And you'll see the difference. 
I was laughing because I said to Shoshana, of course you like that. Everybody picks you in the end. <laughs> so I don't know if that's actually true, but so I think Helen's point, Helen's point um, with the idea that you really, really just don't keep going if it doesn't feel right. That's what you're saying, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and we just got a comment. Thanks a lot. As a future sex therapist, this was super helpful. Anyway, um, I think we're going to come back and talk about different therapy styles. What do you think, Helen? Sure. Okay, that's amazing. I Thank can't you. believe I just said that, but okay. <laughs> Everybody, give us some hearts for Helen here, because she did a great job, and she doesn't love coming on social media. And so, um, anyway, if you have questions about sex therapy or you're interested in doing sex therapy, you can always DM me. I'm here. Um, I try to put little tidbits on Dr. Bacheva, um, but um, Helen's amazing, and uh, I just want to thank, oh, look at all the hearts that are coming in, Helen. Everybody <laughs> loves you. All right. Everybody have a good night and let's hear Thank it for you. therapy. <laughs> Yay. Good night. Bye everyone.